All right, hi everyone. Um, we're going to be talking today. Uh, welcome to this SPSS tutorial. Um, we're going to be talking today a little bit about how to calculate, uh, do some basic descriptive analysis uh, in SPSS. Uh, looking at how to calculate the means, looking at how to calculate variance, standard deviation, and so forth. Um, and, and this is not overly complicated because we're not actually doing these calculations. We're actually having SPSS do the calculations for us, uh, which when you have a lot of responses to your surveys or your experiments, your questionnaires, or so forth, you don't want to do them all by hand. You could have tens, hundreds, possibly thousands of responses and to calculate means, standard deviations, and uh, variance is a very complicated thing. Well, it's not very complicated, again, because we've said that a lot of statistics is just basic uh, rules that are applied mathematics, but uh, it just definitely does get tedious. Uh, so we're going to go over that a little bit today and we'll talk about them with some of the specific statistics that we would use. In the second part of this we'll talk a little bit about z-scores which is one of the first comparison statistics we use and we'll talk a little bit about hypothesis testing and error rates towards the very end. So to begin with I'm going to open up the data file and uh, sorry I'm going to be bouncing back again to share some of the uh, screen from SPSS as we go along with this so I can show you how to do this in SPSS. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to screen share, bear with me because I know it gets a little dizzy, I haven't quite figured out how to share the full screen uh, in a convenient way so far. And I might bounce back to a couple of websites and graphics and, and PowerPoint slides that I have as well. We're going to start now and we're going to show you uh, the entire screen and uh, move over to SPSS. So here we are in SPSS. We're looking at supermarket data. We've used this before in class and it's a good sample set uh, just to get a hold of what's going on with a particular set of data and a set of data that we've already have collected for us. So you can see here we have our data view. Um, I'm going to switch briefly over to the variable view. You can see the list of variables with their labels and some of them have values and obviously the measurement. But we're going to switch over to, sorry, we're going to, whoops, we're going to switch over to the data view. And we see here all of the variables going across in the columns and each case respondents answers going on the uh, vertical. All right, so let's say we have um, the supermarket data and um, interestingly enough this is from, looks like maybe it was collected in England uh, and we want to know how much people spend at the supermarket. So we have this variable going down, amount spent. Now we've talked about in class about uh, different types of measurements for statistics such as the mean, such as variance, such as standard deviation, such as range. Um, we have quartiles which is when the data is divided into uh, three parts, four parts, um, and how much percentage of the data is in the 20, the, the, the bottom quartile, there's the bottom 25, the middle 25, the upper middle 25, and then the top 25% of all the data. We've also talked about range, so what's the minimum amount involved in the data, and what's the maximum, and if you subtract the minimum from the maximum, you would find the range. We've talked about central tendency, which is how much data revolves around the mean. And then we've talked about dispersion, which is how far the data varies from the mean and how much of that data varies how far from the mean. All right, so with that in mind, we're going to go look at this amount spent. And what we see here is do whole dollars, and this is a continuous variable or scale variable in SPSS. 
So one of the things I want to find with this data is how to calculate the mean. So to do this, I go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, and the first thing I want to do is take frequency counts. And I'm not just going to do, sorry, I said amount spent, the expenditures on meat, the expenditures on fish, the expenditures on variable, how many percent buy an own brand or generic product. This is, do you own a car, yes or no? Percentage amount spent on organic food. Are you vegetarian, yes or no? How many people are in your house? How many kids do you have? So I just took, wanted to review a little bit of that data because I think I'm just going to add a little bit more in than just amount spent. I'm going to add a couple of other variables into calculating these statistics. So one of the things I want to start off with, I'm going to go to Analyze, Descriptive Statistics, and Frequencies. When I do this, you'll see obviously here are all the variables I have to choose from. I have an option to display frequency tables. What that does is it tells me the frequency counts for each variable. And so I'm going to select a couple of variables. I'm going to select the monthly amount spent on food. I'm going to select the monthly meat expenditure, fish expenditure, vegetable expenditure, and I'm also going to select um, the household size, how many people are in a household. And again, this is just for the analyses that I'm going to run. You may be running different analyses. When I go to the statistics box, you can see that it gives me an option of a variety of statistics. So I can show what the quartiles are for each uh, variable. I could show what percentiles are for each variable. So obviously, quartiles are 25%. But it, let's say I wanted to show what thirds are. I could do percentile at the bottom 33% and the upper 33%. Or, or, or sorry, the upper 67%. Or I could do another 67% and now show, break it up into three. So we have a variety of different options for percentile values. I can get SPSS to calculate the mean, which is the average, the median, which is the bottom versus top 50% of responses, the mode, which is the most frequent responses, and there may be multiple modes. Uh, if there are, it will report, I believe, it's the lowest one. We also have measures of dispersion, such as standard deviation, variance, range, so we talked about what that is, the variance is the how far data varies, and then the standard deviation is, uh, is, so the variance is the total variance from the mean, the standard deviation is how far particular data points are from the mean. The range is how far the data extends from the minimum to the maximum. And then what we didn't talk a lot about in our class but we should acknowledge is something called skewness and kurtosis. Skewness tells us how far the data is skewed from, say, a central point such as zero. So if there is a lot of data that is not near zero, we may say that it is skewed left or skewed right. If it is kurtosis or kurtotic, we may say that there is a lot of data that is spread thinly from the mean, and so, or that a lot of the data is very centralized around the mean. So that kind of reflects largely in how the distribution is actually shaped. But these two statistics here actually are statistics of how the, the distribution is shaped. But we're not going to get into that for our purposes now. We're going to focus mostly on quartiles, central tendency statistics, and dispersion. So now that I've decided on these statistics that I want to report, I go to continue. Okay, that locks in the statistics that I'm going to run. When I now go to charts, I'm presented with an option of variety of charts. Everything from bar charts to pie charts 
to histograms. Typically when we are trying to reflect data and show a representation of data, we typically use histograms. They look kind of like bar charts of frequencies. And then what we can do with these histograms is we can show a normal curve so that way we can see visually how the data reflects versus a normal distribution. So I am going to check that off as well and continue. I do not need to do anything really with the format and at this juncture I don't need to do anything with bootstrapping either. So we're going to focus just on statistics and just on charts. And again I've selected to display frequency tables and now I'm going to hit OK. SPS is doing its thing. And voila. So you can see here at the top, because I did frequencies, that SPSS shows us on the top here each of the variables. And then the statistics we ask to be run going on the side here. So we can see that n, which is how many responses we have, are 150 across each of these variables. No missing data for e any of these variables, which is good. And now we see here the monthly amount spent. The SPSS calculated this mean as 52.89 or $52.90. The median Again, so the median 50% versus bottom 50% was split at $54.89. Multiple modes existed. SPSS tells us that with this footnote and says that the mode, the most frequent response was that people spend $25.91 with a standard deviation or plus or minus $14.06. So when we talk about standard deviation, we're typically talking about one standard deviation or how far how far does the data vary from the mean to one standard deviation? Because as I'm going to demonstrate with this graphic, one standard deviation is actually representative of 68.26% of the population that covers a substantial amount of the population. Now, as we keep going to two standard deviations, we cover 95.44%. As we go to three standard deviations, we get 99.73%. That's great, but it almost tells us too much information of the data. It doesn't give us much meaning. So typically, when we talk about standard deviation, <laughs> we're referring to one standard deviation from the mean because that represents two-thirds of the population and that's a substantial amount. All right, so let's go back to SPSS output. So that one standard deviation was $14, plus or minus $14.06. The variance is actually a squared number of the standard deviation. You may remember that from basic statistics. So if we were to square 14.06, we would get about 197.696. Again, typically we use standard deviation because it's more easier than using variance. But All right. And then the range of responses are $49.45. The lowest response was $25.91. Coincidentally, this is the mode, and the maximum was $75.37. I suspect that this $25.91 is coincidentally the mode because we use a continuous variable. And continuous variables are very difficult to have to find modes um, because typically we use frequencies when we are using categorical variables, not continuous variables. And we're clued in here that multiple modes exist and that the smallest value is shown. So my suspicion is that 
for this particular variable, it's one and the same. So as I mentioned, it's 4945 for the range. So if we were to actually to add that to 2591, we would see the maximum here of 7537. Now, I had previously asked SPSS to show me quartiles, what the different percentages would be from the lowest to the highest. And so the 25% cutoff would be $40.74, would be 50, the 50% would be $54.89. You will note that that is the same as the median. Why? Because the median is the upper, splits the upper 50% and the lower 50%. And we are here at the 50th percentile. And then you'll see the same thing with the 75th percentile as being $65.10. So if you'd like, you can go look through the meat expenditures and the fish expenditures and the vegetable expenditures. These are all very similar in how we would interpret them. Now let's look for a second at the household size because we said that household size was uh, a continuous variable, but um, we just want to make sure that we can interpret it accordingly. The mean household size out of 150 responses was 2.04. So 2.04 people per household. Doesn't quite make sense to have 0.04 people per household. But, but we just want to make sure that that's what the mean actually is. And that's why you see sometimes like, oh, there's two and a half people per household. Well, there's obviously not a half a person per household. But when we take into consideration all of the responses, we may get a mean. So it does matter when we need to interpret this data. The same thing, the median ha response is one. So 50% is one have one uh, person per household. The standard deviation is 1.433. So the majority of households are 2.04 people plus or minus 1.43 people. Again, this doesn't quite make sense, so we need to know what our variables actually mean when we're interpreting data. That's very important. With dollars spent, that makes sense to have a fraction, but with household size, it doesn't. But we do report as such. The minimum household was one, and the maximum household was five, with a range of four. And again, the percentiles at the 25th percentile was one. The 50th percentile, which was the same as the median, was one. And the 75th percentile was three. All right, so we reported those, and I mentioned that I was going to add in the frequency tables, and you can see these frequency tables. For the monthly amount spent, nobody has repeated the same thing twice. For the meat expenditure, nobody has repeated the same thing twice. Same with the fish. For the vegetables, is the same thing. The household size, we obviously have more frequency because we're talking about whole people. We're talking about a continuous variable, but we're talking about people who are one person per household, two persons per household, three persons per household. It makes no sense to have zero people per household. And maybe in this sample, none of them had six people per household. So obviously the frequencies are a lot tighter on this than they are with money or income or other variables that tend to be ratio variables that don't reach very high and are typically not into uh, whole numbers. All right. So um, again, this is all in interpretation. And a lot of statistics is this interpretation, this ability to collect the data and interpret the data. We'll collect, analyze, and then interpret. All right, so the C frequency table, you can see 89 had one family, had one member per household, that's 59.3%. This two people per family were 12, that was 
and so forth. So again, this is reading these frequency tables. Now, as I mentioned, the way we analyze this allows for a histogram, and a histogram shows us the normal distribution, which is this curve, along with the frequency count of the monthly amount spent. So you can see that there is a very high frequency around the what looks like 65-ish dollars spent, roughly. Interestingly, when it reports the mean over here and the standard deviation, that would be roughly here. So you can see that for the monthly amount spent, how much the normal distribution is. And then if you were to kind of trace it, you could kind of see how the data is represented. So we might show that it skews a little bit more this way. Let's scroll down a little bit. The same thing with the meat expenditure. We can see the distribution goes over here. The average or mean was about $6.92, so right around here, with a standard deviation of 552. But notice this over here. This seems to really skew left in our data. A lot more people, even though the meat are, are dragging this down. So these people may be outliers. We may have some outliers here that are bringing this data down. The same thing when we go down to vegetables. The same thing when we go to fish. We have a lot of skew on the left over here. and then a lot of skew over here. But this is a little bit more balanced. And then how about household size? I have a lot of skew here. One. A lot of people have one. So what does that mean? That means that a disproportionate amount of people are bringing our mean down. Or these people are bringing the mean up because this mean is about 2.04 people. So again, a lot of this is about interpretation of the data and interpretation of the output. Okay, so we've done that. I'm going to bounce back again. All right, so we've done that now, and we've looked at the standard deviation, we've looked at the mean, we've looked at some of the quartiles, the mode, the median. Sorry, I'm just going to adjust this for a second. Okay, so we've done a lot with this, and now we're going to look at calculating uh, z-scores. Now, what is a z-score? We've talked about a z-score as the difference in standard deviation terms of a piece of data from the mean. So typically, when we are doing this z-score, we would the calculation for that is the piece of data minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So obviously, this requires us to know what the mean of the sample is, as well as what the standard deviation is. So all of that needs to be calculated in advance. And fortunately, SPSS can do that. SPSS can also calculate the z-score itself. And that's beneficial to us, because why? Well, we may need to know what outliers there are. And what are outliers? Outliers are responses that are far apart and very far away from the mean uh, to the point where they actually skew the distribution, they skew the mean. So if we have a mean of 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5, we would presume the mean to be 3, right? 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 
divided by 5 would be 3. But if we add 10 to that mix, and we said 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 10, well, now the distribution is skewed by 10, because 10 is much larger than 5, and 10 is going to increase the mean substantially. So let me just calculate 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 10 plus 4 plus 10 is equal to 20 divided by 5 is... Wait, 2, 3 is 6, and 4 is 10, and 10 is 20, divided by 5 is 4. So we've now increased the mean substantially from 3 to 4 just by adding a real big outlier. So sometimes the median is more robust to those outliers. Or what we'll frequently do is look for outliers in our data and try and eliminate those outliers so that way we have a mean that is more reflective of the population as a whole. All right, so let's do this. We'll do this with using z-scores. And I'll switch back to SPSS and to this data and try and find out what some of these outliers might be in some of the data. And how about, how exactly to calculate that. So let me switch back my screen. And I will go back to SPSS. All right, now. Here we have this data, and we want to know what some of these outliers are. Well, how do we go about finding what the outliers are? What is drastically changing or skewing the mean from what a normal distribution would be? Well, one way of going about finding outliers, and I'm going to show you this very briefly, we talked about descriptive terms in our previous analysis of frequency. Now if I go to analyze descriptive statistics, descriptives, I can again choose monthly amount spent, meat expenditure, fish expenditure, variables, uh, vegetables expenditure, and household size expenditure. When I go to options, I again can get the mean, the standard deviation, the variance, the range, the minimum, and the maximum, right? It's another way of going about doing that. But what descriptives menu also allows me to do is save the standardized values as variables. And what standardized values means is the z-score. Because again, we can have scales with ranges that go from 1 to 5, 1 to 7, 1 to 1,000. And then we could have a scale that goes from 1 to 1,000, 1 to 5, or 1 to 3. And we have no meaningful comparison. But we do have a sample. And we do know that that sample should probably be normally distributed. So by using the z-score, we're using the mean of the sample and finding out how far something deviates from the mean. How far one piece of data or one potential outlier deviates from that mean. And this is good because we can get these scores calculated again without having to do all of the calculations ourselves. So I'm going to save these z-scores as variables. And what you'll see when I do this is the output's going to come out in SPSS, but I'm also going to have additional columns that show the z-scores for these individual variables. And using that information, I can then detect which pieces of data are outliers, which are potentially more than three standard deviations from the mean. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to go ahead, and just like we did with the frequency statistics on this side, we can see from the descriptive statistics, the variables are now on the left, and the statistics are now on the right, on the top, sorry. 
So now in this instance, the monthly amount spent, the minimum is $25.91, the maximum is $75.37, the mean $52.90, with a standard deviation of $14.06, and there is the variance, right? It's just a different way of showing what we already saw all the way up here under frequency statistics. Now if I go back into the data view here, you will see that I now have additional variables. I now have a z-score for amount spent, and if you briefly hover over it, you see the uh, full label of the variable. I have the z-score of the meat expenditure, the z-score of the fish expenditure, and the z-score of the vegetables, and the z-score of the house size. So I can find now these z-scores are already calculated for me and tell me how many standard deviations from the mean this data is. So again, we talked about cases. Cases are each of the respondents, are one respondent's responses across all of the variables. Well, now they have a z-score for that response. So in this instance, the person's amount spent was $42.13. If I scroll over now, I see a z-score for case one saying that this person is minus 0.766 standard deviations from the mean. This person is 0 0.700 standard deviations from the mean. Let's go down. This person's, again, these are for z-scores for amount spent. This person's z-score is 1.35 standard deviations from the mean on the amount spent but they only had 0 .507 standard deviations from the mean on their meat score. This person was 2.03 standard deviations from the mean on their meat score. And again, we have for fish, we have for vegetable, we have for house size, and so forth. Again, this will tell us for each person, for each z-score, for each variable, what, how many standard deviations they are from the mean. A quick tip here, and I am sure that this is going to be buried in this tutorial, but I want to make it, it make, make it apparent. If I right-click on a variable, I can sort that variable. So if I go to sort ascending for the z-score for the amount spent, I can go from negative all the way scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down to the positive. So I do not see anybody whose amount spent is an outlier. Nobody has even more than two standard deviations or minus two standard deviations. This is close to minus two, but not minus two. We may look for a standard deviation cutoff score of plus or minus three standard deviations. Again, because that covers 90, almost nine, more than 99% of the population or of the normal distribution. That's a lot of people. So if somebody has a z-score greater than 3 or less than minus 3, we may think seriously about that person's score being an outlier. Okay, what about meat? What if I sort by meat for ascending? Well, again, no z-score is less than minus 2 or greater than minus two. Well, there are a couple that are greater than minus two. So you may think about these people as having potentially outlier responses. But it's not drastic. It's not three standard deviations. So I'll leave it for this instance. How about fish? Outliers? Not anything drastic. Aha! We have fish scores that are outliers substantially. This person's fish score is 4.42 standard deviations from the mean.
Let me just go back and see what their response is. Fish. Okay, $14.48. And I'm going to go back to check my statistics. The mean was $2.50 for fish, and that person spent $14 on fish. So that person's data is going to skew the mean. If I took that person's data out, I might see a drastic difference in what the mean actually is. So let me just do that to show you. Let me take their fish score out. I'll remove that. And now I want to go analyze, descriptives, fish. I'm going to get rid of every th these two. And I'm going to get rid of these two. And I'm going to now show, um, I just wanted to show what the mean is. The mean is now $2.42. So you see that one dropped down from, dropped the mean from $2.51 to $2.42, or 43 cents rather. But I do have more people here whose Z scores were high. This person's was my over three, this person, this person, this person, this person, and this person. Let me get all of these three, uh, these that are over three out of the fish. I'm going to delete, 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 and I'm going to rerun my mean. Descriptives, statistics, descriptives, and now let's look at the mean. Now you can see that the mean is went from two dollars and forty two cents to two dollars and or forty three cents to two dollars and nine cents and the standard deviation is much lower too and the maximum is much lower too so that will show you how outlying data if I go back to the fish expenditure histogram is outlying data over here really impacted the distribution, really impacted the mean. And let me just do one more thing for practice. We'll go back to descriptives, frequencies. I'm going to go, I want to do a, another histogram just to show you the difference. Now that we've taken those outliers out, this is the histogram for the fish. It looks a little more normal, doesn't it? certainly more normal than the histogram here. All right, so now that we've done some z-scores, I'm going to flip back for a second. All right. So now that we've done some mean, we've done some standard deviation, we've done some range, we've done some mode, we've done some variance, we've done some quartiles. Um, what else have we done? Minimum and maximum. Um, we've done some z-scores. So we've done quite a bit. The next thing I want to do before I go is to talk a little bit about hypothesis testing. And when we talk about hypothesis testing, we're typically talking about two hypotheses. The first hypothesis is the null hypothesis. And this typically assumes that there is no difference from the rest of the population. I'm going to switch back to a slide here. I'm going to share it one second. Okay. Oh, actually, I do want to share one more thing before we, we, we talk about the hypotheses. I'm going to share the screen, and I'm going to bounce over to a slide for a second. How to use, a how to use the z-distribution table. All right. So I have a z-score, and let's say it was... Mm, Let's say the z-score was 0.62 standard deviations from the mean. Well, how would we go about finding what the probability, what percentile is that? 0.62 standard z-scores, 0.62 standard deviations. What we would first do is look at 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.
down going down this way and then look for the O2 so we look at the tens the tenths down this way and then we look at the hundredths this way so we start with the tenths and we worked to the hundredths so 0 0.6 2 is equal to 0.23. This person is equal to 23%. Whoops, where did I go? 0.62 is equal to 23.24% of the population is 0.62 above the mean. 0.62 standard deviations. If I wanted to go negative 0.62, I would flip that and I would subtract it from 1. Okay. Let's say I wanted to figure out what popular percentage of the po you know, what 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 if I was uh in the uh 64% uh, of the population above the mean. How, how would I find 0.64 percent? Well, 0.64 percent is tricky because it's not there. It actually means that I'm on the other side of the mean. So let's give me another example. Let's do point, let's do 18 mm, percent of the population. How would I find out what my standard deviation would be if I was at 18 percent of the population? Well, I would look on here for 18%, the closest thing. 21, 21, 20, 20, 19, 19, 18, 18, 44, 18, 08. The closest thing is in this row, which is 0.4, and this column, which is 0.7. So 18% of the population, I'm at roughly 0.747 standard deviations from the mean relatively close to the mean. And again, to find the other direction, you would subtract from 1. All right. So I'm going to jump over again, because uh, I've done this. I want to jump back to uh, a slide that we've done previously. We had talked quite a bit about how the sample is used to infer, make inferences about the population. So we see here mu is equal to the population, sigma is a standard deviation, sigma squared is the variance, rho is the correlation, and then we have big N is the number of elements in the population. And we're going to make inferences about the population from a sample. So one of the things we want to do is talk about null hypotheses versus alternate hypotheses. I'm going to bounce back for a second. Whoops. All right. I'm actually going to do redo quickly what the z-score thing is. because apparently it failed to show the z-score. All right, so very quickly, again, if we were 1.56 standard deviations from the mean, we would look at the tenths and say 1.5, and then the hundredths as 6, so 44.06 standard deviations from the mean. And very quickly, if I wanted to find 24% uh, of the population, the probability being 24% of the population above the mean, I would look here, 28, 27, 26, 25, 25, 24, 86, 24, 54, 24, 22, 23, 89. This one's a little bit closer, so this is the row for 0.6 and the column for 0 0.04, 0 0.64. My standard deviation would be 0.64 standard deviations from the mean. And again, if I was looking at the other side, I would subtract it from 1. Now, 
I will bring back that slide that I originally intended to show, this one. You see mu is the mean, sigma is the standard deviation, and sigma squared is the variance, and rho is the correlation of the population and then of the sample. All right. So what exactly does this mean? Well, it means that we want to come up with a uh, null hypothesis that has to do with the population so we can make inferences about the population from the sample. So in this instance, uh, altern uh, a null hypothesis typically is something that equals or doesn't equal something. So we may have a hypothesis that says that the average number of iPhones that is bought on the first day of release per person is, or per store is 100. So from a sample of maybe one Apple store, we would find out how many people had bought the iPhone. Now let's say we need to test whether or not that's true. Well, we would typically have an alternative hypothesis, one that says that the sample, that the population, uh, the average number of iPhones bought in an Apple store is not equal to 100, or is less than 100, or is greater than 100. So let's say we're sampling a store. One store shows that the average number, that the number uh, of, of, in Boston, of Boston Apple stores, is equal to 120. Well, we have one hypothesis that says that the population of all the Apple stores is, is, is equal to 100 uh, averages 100 per store but the Boston area stores average 120 per store so what do we do well if the null if the null hypothesis is that it equals 100 we would have to reject that null hypothesis because our data shows that it's 120 typically then we would accept the alternative which it would be that it's not equal to 100, or if we were more specific, that it's equal, or that, rather that it's greater than 100. We would accept that as the, as the alternative hypothesis. Now we have a problem of something called type 1 error and type 2 error. With type 2 error, what we're doing is we're having false positives. We are saying that we believe that the null hypothesis is true even though the data is showing otherwise. So let's say that the data shows 120, 120 phones are sold in the Massachusetts stores, but we hypothesize that all population of Apple stores sell average 100. And let's say we accepted that null hypothesis. We have a problem because the average is not 100 or probably is not 100, because we would not have an average of 100 if all of the Boston stores have 120. So now we have errored. We have done what's called type 2 or beta errored. We have false positive information to accept the null hypothesis, because we have shown information that it is not equal to 100. Now let's say it's the other way around. Let's say we've accepted or we've rejected that it's 100. And the data has shown um, that it is 100. Let's say that the Boston area stores actually show an average of 100 sold per store and we said that that's not true. Well now we have a false negative and that's a type 1 error or alpha error. The problem is that we trade off type 1 error versus type 2 error. If we want to be 99% sure that we have a 
false negative instead of a false positive, then we're trading off the 1% that may say it's a false positive, or vice versa. So as we get into hypothesis testing, you'll see frequently see this P is less than 0.05. That gives us an, a 5% chance of a false negative versus a false positive. And if we go less than 0.05 and we move to 0.01, now we're trading off the error that we potentially would be making in a false negative versus a false positive. So we make these trade-offs when we set these alpha versus beta errors. It's easier to deal with alpha, and this is why alpha is usually set at 0.05 because it's a convenient alpha and a convenient error rate for us to accept with 95 percent confidence in our hypoth in testing our hypothesis. If we say 99 percent, well we're potentially very confident but we may have a false positive and that's a problem or it could be a problem. Think about if you're a pharmaceutical company and you're manufacturing a drug. If you have false positives that come into your drug testing, these could be very deadly. So accepting levels of risk in hypothesis testing is very important and balancing the right amount of risk is also important. So what have we talked about today? Well, we've talked about the mean and other central tendency uh, statistics. We've talked about uh, mode. We've talked about median. We've talked about range. We've talked about quartiles. We've talked about dispersion, such as variance and uh, standard deviation. And we've talked a little bit about the shape of graphs, the skew of graphs with data that, particularly of outliers, or data that is a little bit where the, the mean is shifted, or most of the data is shifted one way from the mean, or most of the data is shifted the other way from the mean. And we also talked a little bit about interpreting how to, these statistics in SPSS. And we've also talked about z scores, how to calculate z scores in SPSS, and how to interpret z scores in SPSS, how to use the z score distribution table and then a little bit about null hypothesis testing. So hopefully that helps with this lesson and uh, we'll see you the next time.